Okay, welcome to our Autumn Blessings tissue box. Um, this is a very sweet and short dry brushing lesson for how to paint pumpkins or how to do the dry brush technique. So this is meant to be an overview. I'm going to explain the brushes to you. I'm going to explain why it works. I'm going to explain how to do it. I'm going to show you what not to do. Um, so super duper awesome, simple dry brush lesson. I hope you enjoy. Okay, I want to talk about how these, um, these surfaces come flat, so just like Ikea furniture, and you need to assemble them, and they're super easy to do, but I wanted to go ahead and address this in the video. Um, number one, what I do when I am assembling is I have my glue ready. I like the fast grab tacky glue, and I love this little sampler size packet. The glue doesn't dry out before you get done with it, um, and then you have a couple varieties of glues to choose from. And then what I do um, when I assemble is I go ahead and I do a dry assemble. So I got my box and I fitted all the pieces together so that I understood what I was doing. And then I took it apart and laid everything out in a logical sequence so that I would know what I was doing when I glued it. And then I just put a very flat bead on the pieces that touch wood. So you would put glue on this piece right here and then you would put glue on this piece over here on this side. So you just need to look at where the things will overlap and then glue those and don't put too much and have a paper towel ready to wipe it off. You're not going to be staining this so it doesn't matter if you have some glue smear on there. And then after you get done um, assembling it, then you go ahead and just secure it with a rubber band. This one is very lovely because it self um, squares because once you put the top on it is absolutely going to be square. Okay, so But this will just keep everything from sliding apart. You can put a couple rubber bands if you wanted to. The next thing that you're going to want to do, just like any wood surface, pine or um, whatever, any surface, um, you might need to use a little bit of wood filler. Um, every now and again, something won't quite meet, and it depends on how much paint you're going to use. You could sometimes just fix these things with a little bit of paint going in that surface. So you apply your wood filler, and you're going to use a palette knife. And preferably, you want to use a wood filler that you can add a little water to because they tend to get gunky, like this is completely dried up. Okay, so add a little bit of water and mix that in. Reactivate. So you can see that this is almost thixotropic, which means that it gets creamier as you work it. And so now I have a lovely consistency. I love that I can make this. Um, the consistency that I want. So if I think that I have an issue there, then I'm going to go ahead and just put my wood filler there, Oops. wipe off the excess, and then when it dries we'll sand it. Alright, I've got all-purpose sealer, and this is what I'm going to use to seal all the surfaces of this project. This is going to make sure that my project, um, well, it doesn't warp, it won't, won't warp anyway because it's a box but it'll make sure that everything is nice and sealed and it makes a kind of paint sandwich. So this product penetrates the wood and then the paint is made to penetrate this product and then the varnish is meant to penetrate both. So it all kind of goes together. Okay, so now that my surface is dry, I've got one coat on there, I probably could use a little bit of sanding on there. That grain has raised up just a little, although actually, I forgot, we're doing a dry brushing project so if you have just a little bit of grit it actually increases like the, the dryness, so don't over sand. You don't want it super slick. Okay, so we're going to get it based black again. Watch your drips over the edges. That's something that um, can be a problem sometimes. So get it black. Now black will suck in color quite a bit, so you want to be careful with this technique. And then you'll pick up a little bit of your thalo. I've got the media phthalo green blue. You want to just kind of slip slap that in the background and then you pick up a little bit of the peacock. It's such a rich color. I almost think I might need to switch to a smaller brush. This is kind of being clunky. Okay, I've picked up just a smaller version of the oval glaze. Oh yeah, that's better. I 
And we're going to do this on all the sides. Switch back to my big one. I'm wanting it kind of whiskey. Wispy, not whiskey. It's five o'clock somewhere, I guess. Okay. So, yeah, that's better. So just jockey back and forth until you get the effect that you like. Uh, let's see if I can get that glare to show you what I've got. Anyway, it's going to be like an internal kind of light. And I'll swap it over. I'm going to have to let that dry on the two sides before I can do my tops. Okay, we're going to go ahead and use a compass to make our lines all around our banding. So we're going to do the tops and the bottoms all the way around. And this is just a perfect way to not have to measure and mark and then make your line in between. This just makes all the way around. Okay, next I'm going to tape. I'm going to tape my sides all the same. Be careful with the masking tape. It has a tendency to bow and it'll make your lines all wonky. And do make sure that your paint is really dry when you are taping because otherwise it can lift. Alright, we're going to mix a little bit of Payne's Gray with our, true, our Peacock Blue. Make it kind of a toned teal color. Okay, and then what I'm looking for, totally did that off camera, sorry about that. What I'm looking for is if I put this peacock teal on this black, it would be so like electric. So this color is going to be just much more settling than that color. Okay, so I want to make something that's going to make a nice border that I can accent and stuff, but I don't want it to take over the universe. <clears throat> so, I'm going to take my ink sweeper, and I'm just going to bring a little bit of this paint over here, and I'm going to apply it into the ink sweeper, but make it very flat. Totally out of shift. Make it very flat. And then you've got to be careful with this. I like that this is long, um, so it'll cover these lines quickly, but you want to be careful not to go outside of your tape line, because I didn't use a very fat tape. Okay, so then I'm just going to go along and make sure that I get right up next to my line without going over. Okay, and see how quickly that goes. And none of this like, and if I used a great big round or even a little round brush, if I did a teeny dome, then I'd be tapping at it for a hundred years. And so if I use a big one, then I'd probably be going outside of my, my area. So this is a perfect applicator for long skinny bands. Okay, then I'll peel off my tape right away. Nice and perfect crispy lines. Okay, when you get done with these little daubers, go ahead and just squish and rinse them out in the sink. And you don't need to use soap, otherwise you'll get foamy um, little sponges. And then just let them dry in the dish drainer or whatever, and they'll be good to use for another time. All right, I want to talk about what makes the brush right for dry brushing. Um, years ago I used to use a French brush um, that um, Rosemary West used and that's who I learned dry brushing from. But um, they, French people went on strike for like, I don't know, half a year and then the brush was not available for a really long time. So I had the brush manufacturers send me, the American brush manufacturers send me brushes that were filberts because in, in essence a filbert brush is one that is cut with an oval top. Okay, so then, um, but if you don't have a really like nice stiff bristle, then your brush is going to kind of lay down when you're trying to do the um, the dry brush. So you really want a very stiff brush. And then the other thing that is different about this, um, out of like I don't know, out of 50 brushes that I tried, this is the only brush that I found that would come anywhere near close, and uh, and I've never gone back. So here's what makes it different: it's very stiff bristled, it's cut like a filbert. And then the absolute best, biggest difference, I'm showing you on this big brush because the little ones aren't as easy to see as the big one. But can you see this taper from side to side? That's the key, making this not, um, this isn't a filbert brush anymore, now it's a glazing brush. Um, and so what happens when you do this, get one that's a little bit more, is when you press on it, it's going to splay out really nicely. And then the little tips there, it kind of like will cup like a, a little bit of a like a bent over U shape. And it'll stay 
kind of cupped like that. And then you can just simply, with these end pieces, kind of flick on your color. And that's what we're doing when we're dry, br dry brushing. Now, some people confuse dry brushing with what I call dry rubbing. Um, dry rubbing, you use one of two kinds of brushes. You want to use a stiff bristle brush, either a dome or a crescent. And then you just simply kind of do that, that theorem. Um, there's another name for it. Anyway, but you're just rubbing on very, very, very dry, non-existent paint, and it makes a really lovely, um, non-scratchy looking rub. And so it's a little bit... It's a little bit nicer when you want not to see any scratches, but with dry brushing, you want it to look. It's an old world painting technique that the masters used to use, and you want to use, um, you want to see those scratches, and then after you layer the scratches, they tend to disappear um, to your eye. Okay, and then the other thing I want to talk about is if you are, let's put these in order, if you are a heavy handed, if you always kind of like push on your paintbrush a lot, um, or if you're light handed where you just are always just tickling, then if you're light-handed, you want to go to a bigger brush. And if you're heavy-handed, you want to go down to a smaller brush because heavy-handed people will make that brush open up. Light-handed people are going to use it just as like a, just on the tip and not push at all. I'm going to go somewhere in the middle. Um, and this is uh, number eight. And there isn't a right size or a wrong size. I painted a whole two-foot-tall rooster with a number two once. So um, there's no right or wrong. You can wash your brush, you can rinse your brush um, in between, you just want to make sure you pinch all the water out. Okay. And then the loading technique is the really, really important thing that we're going to talk about here. So what you want to do is you do not want to go in and just like scoop up a big old wad of paint. Okay. What you want to do is you want to come in there and you want to push on your brush. And when I teach a class, I want to like almost hear the thumping and just walk back and forth and then as you see, if you don't see any streaks in here, then you can walk in and grab a little bit more. I have no idea why this works. I, I haven't been able to figure it out. What will happen is you'll end up with a big ridged bunch of paint on top and you'll end up perfectly flat on the bottom. So that is a very distinct thing. If you don't have a big ridge of paint on your brush, then you're not going to get a nice dry brush look. I, every now and again, I'll kind of flip my brush to a little bit to the edge so I get rid of what I call saddlebags. And the saddlebags are big ridges of paint on either side of the brush. Okay, so I've got a nice ridge, and you can see it's shiny right there, of color. And then you have to do the flick. So the flick just makes it so that when you start, you don't end up with like a line of paint. You want to end up with a very graduated line, and so that's what the flick is for. I'm going to come over here. Sorry about my runny nose. And now I'm on a box, so I'm going to have to get a little bit higher. So hopefully this doesn't mess up as far as um, what you see in the video. Okay, so now I'm going to just apply the paint going almost or all the way to my edges and not quite meeting it at the bottom because what's going to happen is um, that fade is going to allow your background to be one of your first shadow colors. All we're doing is hot painting with highlights. We're going to start with the darkest highlight, highlight a little bit more, highlight a little bit more, highlight a little bit more. We don't go backwards in shade, which will make a lot of you very happy. Okay, so just get on either side. You want to see those scratches. You want to use shape following. And you don't quite want to come down and touch all the other elements, and you don't quite want to touch the um, edges of the sections. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that. The neat thing about this is your first um, color is going to be almost unseeable, which means that it's a great um, way to get the like the technique down. Now I'm not going to wash my brush. This is going to be dirty brush, and so what that will mean is my colors are laid out from lightest to darkest and that will mean that this color will tone this color that will tone this color that will tone this color that will tone this color and when you get all done all of your paints will become a family um, just because the, there will be a little bit of each in your final um, application and that is a lovely way to make a beautiful harmonious project 
Okay, always do the flick. And there we go, Got the next sections. I lean on the edge of my brush to get um, the outline. Sometimes you want to get all the way to the edge, so I'll lean over and almost chisel instead of flat. I'll come this way and it makes a little line. Let's do that on camera. Instead of flat, I'll go this way and we'll do that one more time because that's fun. Sorry. Instead of flat, we'll go sideways and see that nice sharp edge right there. And that's what we're looking for. Okay, a little, little bit more. Flick on the brush, flick on the um, paper towel. If you have to be pushing to get your paint to apply or here, then you probably need to load a little bit more paint. And I am speaking to myself because I'm not getting enough paint there. So you just go back over, pick up more. If you start getting a little um, like Thailand looking shoe shape on the end of your brush where it's flipped up like the toe of those Thai shoes, um, then you need to wash your brush out and then re-dirty it with the color that you're doing. Okay, so if you have anything that doesn't appear quite dark enough, like this one is over a highlight area, you can increase, and you don't have to go all the way down, your coverage. We'll pull out just a little bit further. The neat thing about dry brushing is your paint is on in being applied in really thin layers. And what that means for you is you are going to be dry almost instantly. Okay, so I don't know how well you can see it because this is dark on dark, but I can see my blue through my sections and stuff, or my blue and black. Okay, then next I'm going to wipe my brush off, and I'm going to go into this next color, which is Oxblood. And what you'll see as I'm mixing is you'll see this start turning into a different color than this. It's darkening up because I've got that paint in there. If you find that you're not getting much difference between your colors, then you might need to wipe off a little bit more. And then I'll flick on the paper towel. Now this coat is not going to go as far down on the pumpkin as the other one did. So it'll always start at the top or wherever your highlights will be. And you don't want it to go as close to each other as, as the others. So you want to start separating those colors out just a little bit. Pick up more paint. So now you can start seeing the pumpkin. edges I want to go right up next to my edge but on my pumpkin slices I don't. I want that to fade. So notice that my hand is also straight up and down. That is how you want to apply the paint. You want straight, 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 straight up and down. If your brush starts leaning then what you'll be doing is you'll be um, applying base coat paint and you don't want to be applying base coat paint. I'll wipe up my brush, start working into the next color. I have a Lazy Susan that goes with this. This is actually, in essence, the same um, design. Um, but I like the idea of having uh, different projects that go together. I'll work my brush, my paint in, and flick. Come back here. Now this one's not going to go down as far as the other. And you'll notice that you start um, doing a lot less strokes on each one. Isn't that amazing? It just kind of starts appearing.
Okay, so see here where I'm getting these really strong ridges? That's because I don't have enough paint in my brush. And so I'm pushing and it is not cooperating. So I'll go and apply more paint and I'll have to wait till that dries because that will grab paint. It's really important. Um, I think the loading sometimes is just working the paint unified, unif unifiedly, whatever that word should be, in through the bristles and getting it back down to the tip. Oops. So that one was just me pushing too hard. Okay. Now also what you can do if your brush starts getting that little curl on it, you can come over here and just load to the other side and flip it over and start working the other way. These brushes last and last. Um, they are incredible, incredible brushes. So you don't have to worry about beating them up. They do their job and they keep on doing it. You just want to make sure that you wash your brush well at the end and use the um, brush cleaner and restorer because that is how you will keep your brush in good working order. See, they're starting to look like pumpkins. How cool is that? Okay, now I've got to decide, do I want to go back? Do I need a little bit more richness? Maybe I do. Let's decide and see. So I can use this color as another color and look at how much brighter that section is. And notice it's just like all these little scratches there. I'm just painting scratches on here. But if you notice, it stops appearing like scratches as you go. It's really kind of cool. Ooh, hi. That's nice and strong. I actually kind of think that looks good. Well, happy accidents. Okay, and then as we build, we're going to stop putting maybe as much attention on these back edges and start focusing on the middle or the up front. So I'm going to wipe my brush off. I'm going to go into this amazingly bright color that I hope will work. But notice what's happening to that color. It is toning, big time toning. It's actually very pleasant once it has those other colors mixed in. Okay, I'm sure I'm not wet. And now we're going to go on to, I'm going to start in the middle because this is going to be like really highlighting. And then my brush will also be less full of paint as I go. So I'll start in the front. little touch on the sides. Wipe my brush off and now I've got this yellow color. Zoom. And the colors are oxblood, burnt orange, bright orange, and marigold. But see what's happening to the marigold. It has turned into this lovely orange color. This is just such a wonderful way to paint because of the unifying colors, the colors as they unify. This is my first day with the English language apparently. Okay, so now we're just highlight. Just with that yellow color. Very little painting going on here. And what I love is that we've now done shading, highlighting, and base coating all with one technique, with one brush, and it was a snap. So I know you're going to enjoy this when you try the technique. Um, it's it's just wonderful. Okay, I've done a couple of base coats. I've got my leaves are base coated with raw sienna, and my stems are base coated with black plum. And now I'm going to make my round brush into a dry brush. So I'm going to, with this color still in my brush, I am going to flatten it out because this will make a really tiny little dry brush on these stems. And then I'm going to just skim my color, which is the raw sienna color, down my pumpkin stem. Okay, and so that's going to give that its highlight. I repeat on the other little guy. And 
And I'm going to go into the yellow as well. Dirty brush. Okay. Okay, and at this point, you're going to see that you haven't covered up all your lines. So I'm going to take this little micro eraser. I'm going to go in and get all my lines erased from within. And that will help a lot if you start start seeing just things looking like a little bit weird with white lines in between. It will make everything cohesive. Okay, we're going to take a little bit of our bright orange and our oxblood together. One to one, using the little teeny... Um, brush here and we're going to just dry brush some highlights or some accents on the end of the leaves just to give them just a little bit of a fall look and we'll keep some in I actually think I want to switch to the micro mm, you know I have sad sad news actually can't switch to this brush because they have discontinued it. If you still have it, um, it's a great choice. It's the 1 8 Crescent. So I'm going to have to find a little replacement for it. So I think what I want is just to go ahead and dry rub on the tips of my leaves. Drat those people discontinuing things, huh? If you ever see something for sale online and you want it, buy it because that is a really common occurrence. Okay, I'm going to go into my, um, let's see if I can figure out a replacement somehow. <sighs> sigh. Sigh, sigh, sigh. Okay, so let's try the, um, this dome. This is going to be a little bit floppy. Yep. Okay, when you need something, make it. So what I did is I went and took my eighth inch dome brush and I cut off half of the bristles to half height and tried to taper them at the end. And this should, yeah, that's nice and stiff now. And uh, that's, that's, whoops, hi. crunching and that means that we're just getting that really good um, scumbling movement. Okay, so then I'll take my round and I'll dry brush load and get right up next to my edges here. And so the dry rubbing can kind of give that, um, that real faded look um, really easily and then but it doesn't get right up to the edge so I will go up to the edge and clean it up <clears throat> okay and I think we'll go I think we're going to need a little bit of our marigold color There's a number two um, dry brush that would probably do a really good job of these leaves, but I don't have it. I don't have one here. You want to be careful about getting anything on your background because your background is like all different colors, so you won't be able to easily patch it. <clears throat> okay, I think that that's good. Okay, so we're going to dry rub just a little bit of our Brilliant Red. I really need that number two brush. Silly, silly. I brought all the brushes except that one. <clears throat> okay, and we're going to load a smaller um, into the number six dry brush. Do not ever try to make a... Um, stroke leaf with these brushes because the tapered thing does not allow it to do um, a pretty leaf. 
Okay, so we'll do a little bit of dry brushing on either side in the shadow area of the pumpkins. And that just riches it up just a little bit. Okay, and we could go in and reach into our leaves just a little. Always use a paper towel like this for dry rubbing because otherwise it um, I'm going to go backwards and pick up a little bit of that darker orange. Anyway, because it um, pills up in stuff, so you don't want to use. Okay, and then our final highlights are going to be with Antique White, dry brushed, oops, and make sure that you are flipped on the paper towel. Very dry, and that's just going to bring up that high bend in the pumpkins, make them a little shiny looking. Oops, I got water all over my project. Okay, now that you've got that kind of base there, you want to go in with your color and you want to add a shine within that color. And that just makes it look like it is harder and shinier. You could go into the raw sienna and the um, antique white and you could highlight the stems just a little bit more. them pop out. Okay, we can even highlight our leaves just a little bit with this mix. Yeah, definitely that number two would have been a handy little thing to have here. Okay, we're going to do the wheat. We're going to use our raw sienna and a little bit of water. I'm going to use my Raphael brush and I've soaked it so that um, so that it would um, flow better. It actually works way better if you soak your brushes before you use them, especially if you want good lines. I'm going to pull out just a couple of um, stems. Here, a couple there. These are going to be our the bones of our operation here. And we probably want to go ahead and bring a couple out here as well. Just kind of really cup everything nicely. And then the technique is really kind of fun. Um, you're going to go ahead and give yourself these little wheat heads. I'm setting the brush down and then picking it up really quickly. And that's going to give you um, nice, nice, nice little wee heads. And this brush will do it magically for you. If you are new to lining, I don't recommend buying this brush because you really do need to know what you're doing. But um, if you've been frustrated by round brushes or liner brushes before um, and you know what you're doing, please do yourself a favor and run and get this brush. It's amazing. Okay, and we'll fill, on, fill in the rest of them. Okay, I've mixed a little teeny bit of raw sienna to tone down the uh, marigold color, and we're just going to highlight some of these little wheats. Not all of them. They don't have to necessarily be in the same place. I think you can put different stems of them outside of where the other lines are and just give them that little bit of lift. A little bit more of my raw sienna. That just makes everything jazzy and sparklier.
And as you get to the outer areas, don't add as much. The further you get away from your center of interest, the less your highlights want to be. So you want your highlights, your highest highs to be in the middle, and then out here it'll fade so that it brings the eye into the piece. Okay, now I'm going to get rid of all my little lines, anything that I have hanging out, and we're going to finish up the side and see what else we need. Okay, so we will float with a little bit of dioxazine purple over in the shadow side of the pumpkins. Just a little jazz. Almost going to be asking yourself, do I really even see anything over there? side just a touch and that just really cohesively makes everything flow like it. Gives it a depth or something. Okay we're gonna pull some little fine hairs off the ends of our wheats to bulk them up just a little bit. I'm using the marigold. Do them directionally so Stroke them in the direction that they flow. That just makes everything a little bit more layered and full looking. It's like when you add picks to wreaths and things like that. It just adds to the, the bulk, makes it just more complete somehow. I'm not sure how it works, but I do know that it is a true thing. Now I'm running into a problem right here where I can't have a place to anchor my hands, so I need to turn this so that these don't become the ugliest wheat heads that I've ever seen. <clears throat> Rinse the brush, and then we'll take and spatter just a little bit. I've got my oval rake. And I think we'll make a mix 50-50 of the raw sienna and the um, marigold. I'm going to tap off on my palette to get rid of excess oops. And see what I've done over here? I've already got it on there. So I'm going to use my paper towel, clean that off because I want it where I want it, not where I don't want it. Okay, and then I'll anchor. Okay, what's happening is I don't have enough water or enough paint. And I've done it again. Spatters are very dangerous. Very, 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 very. Got them on the other side too. So move your project, tap it off over there, and bring your project back. And then watch that you don't smear it on your table as well. So now I'm going to want to put my project down someplace where spatters haven't landed. And I'm spattering in the direction and right over the areas with the greenery. Okay, and that just really lends a fullness to it. Add a little bit more of my bright yellow, and I'm going to spatter over here in the trash can. <clears throat> it on the paper towel and then turn the paper towel instead of the project. Okay, I think that that makes a lovely little scene. Alright, so we're going to take our border here and we're just going to add a little bit of just straight peacock at an angle all the way across and then we're going to come back the other direction and do like a little cross hatching. Then we'll focus this right in the middle, not to the edges. Okay, then you'll mix just a teeny bit of the antique white and just highlight in the middle sections of your dry brushing. Just to give it a little bit more pop. <coughs> So we're going to go in with our stencil and I've got a dome brush 
And this dome brush, I don't know if you, let's take a look. They actually start off much taller, but um, what happens is I'm really rough when I clean them, and I actually love them when they get kind of worn out. So be rough when you're cleaning them so that you wear them out quickly, and um, you'll like the effect of everything better. So we're gonna start with our ox blood <clears throat> color. We're just gonna go ahead and give it a base all over. And I think I need some new ox blood. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to dry out our paint and we're going to load into our next color, which is the burnt orange. And we're going to go right up the middle. Well, actually, let's make them lighter at the bottom. So I'll go all the way across and then I'll walk up the letters just a little bit. So what we're going to do is have the um, lighter color be to the middle, like we were talking about that center of interest. So that means the top of this blessed word <clears throat> is going to be where the highlight goes. Okay, so I'll get that. It's not too high. Then we'll wipe that color out. <clears throat> and then we'll go into a mix of this brighter orange. And a little bit more. Some dark colors have a tendency to swallow other colors, so you have to keep refreshing them. Keep it held down. Probably, let's look at it with our other. Now maybe let's go into a yellow, <clears throat> which isn't going to show very much, but it'll unorangeify it just a little bit. It's a very orange lettering right now. two together and see what we think. I'm going to have that nice leaf right there in the middle. So let's take our Raphael and have some of our peacock. A little bit more water. <coughs> Let's give this a little bit of a drop shading. So do it all on the left sides. And that, see how that's just bringing another color in? It's desaturating a little bit because it's a cool color. take our marigold and we're going to use our little brush and a dry rub, dry brush. <clears throat> That's at the top. And see how that's just going to make it just a little bit more in the warm family. Well, I guess orange is pretty freaking warm. But it's taking out the orangey. Okay, so I've got some marigold and the raw sienna on my get some spattering going. I really should have turned it. And 
and I did it again. So turn the paper towel, don't turn the project. Okay, now let's take a look and see if we think that those two things are kind of doing a thing, doing a little flow. And I think they are. So now what I'm going to do is get that dry and then we'll put our leaf in there and I'll show you the easiest way to paint a leaf that you've ever seen. Okay, while I have the paint color out, I'm going to go ahead and spatter around the top. And that's just going to be that uniformity that's going to keep everything together, kind of. <clears throat> I'm going to flip my towel over. I'm going to work on this side right here. I want to do a thin purple band here. All right, I've given myself a T-square with a couple, like, five strips of tape on the edge. And what I'm going to do is create a strip that I can line against, and it won't bleed under, but I can get a really good straight line without having to tape everything. So what I'll do is I'll set it up, and then I'm going to have to figure out where to put my hand. Okay. okay. In this case, I can do this. I guess I can just go from either direction. And is that going to be bright enough? Not bright enough. I'm going to have to get a little bit more of the bright color. Wipe your brush off after you do this. You're not your brush and roller. You're going to keep the pressure even. Okay, nice and easy way to make a little band. Okay, I mixed a little bit of uh, which white, warm white, into purple color. I'm just going to dry brush up the middle and give that just a little bit of a highlight. Okay, so we're going to fill in this little leafy poo with, let's go with, let's go with our raw sienna. it down and give it a nice thin make sure it's really easy to do thin coats with stencils and then repeat them because it dries super quick and then you're not getting bleeding under always wipe off on your paper towel and then pick up a little bit more and do it again it's easier to take the time than to clean up the mess trust me on this I know okay so here comes easy leaf time now that's not quite dry so hopefully that's not gonna bite me in the tush but we're gonna go ahead and just dry rub through the stencil. And what this does is it gives us this ability to create this variegated leaf without hard, difficult floating and other strange shenanigans that you would normally have. So we get a little bit of the dark in the middle <clears throat> with the black plum. And then we can pick up, I've got to have three brushes dirty here. Let's go ahead and pick up a little bit of the yellow. We have a tip of that leaf be the yellow. And then we'll go backwards. So maybe we'll go into the um, raw sienna. Bring that over into the other colors. And the trick is to not stop with one thing, one place, or the other. Take a little bit of red. And go back and go into bit of the bright orange. I'm going to dry that off a little bit more. Scumble, scumble, scumble. Pretty neat leaf, huh? Yep, and I think then we'll take our, oops, I've got my Raphael's all sitting on my paint bucket ridge. Take our black plum. give it some that one right there. Okay. 
there's our leaf. And then we'll do the same with these two up here. Okay, and I think that when I look at this and I get this and this together, I'm beginning to feel like this is busy. So I'm going to go ahead and base those out and just erase them with black. And then I'll respatter to repair. But yeah, I just think, I don't know, somehow, like it's a good idea, but I, you know, too much. Too much, too much. Paint is the best eraser ever. I'll erase some of those spatters so that it doesn't look like I stopped them right there. Okay, I've got a little bit of a black hole going on in my um, stem area. So I'm going to go into my uh, raw sienna and my black plum. And I'm going to diffuse that down just a little bit to the brown side of things. Just to make it, and now I'll pick up raw sienna and just do that. Ooh, hi. No, no, no. We really want that scratchy. So if your black cracks seem like they're just a little too black, you can give them a little bit of pat of makeup to make it all just kind of sink together just a little bit better. Okay, I like that better. Okay, as I'm looking at this, I still feel like I've got a little bit of flat going on. So I'm going to increase some of the colors in the background, just to get some movement going. Add a little bit of white to that. And I think maybe we need to spatter a little bit of the teal plus white. And then we'll repeat over here. blowing leaf movement going on. Plus white. Let's see what we think about that. I think that fills it just a little bit more. 